Hi, everyone. Welcome to MassBio's Town Hall with President and CEO Bob Coughlin. I'm Jennifer Nason, Vice President of Communications and Content for MassBio, and we're thrilled to have with us today Matthew Harrison, who's Managing Director and Head of Biotech Industry Research at Morgan Stanley. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome, Bob. We're thrilled to have you with us. Thanks. Nice to be here. Good morning, Jenny. And, and Matthew, thank you for joining us today. I, you know, before we get into this, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, it's the beginning of December already. My goodness, how fast does the, does the year pass? It's been amazing to see how much has gone on. And, and I think our conversation this morning is going to be wonderful. But I want to thank Morgan Stanley. I want to thank your company, Matthew, for being such an amazing partner to MassBio. For those of you in the audience that don't know, Morgan Stanley is our, our, our primary sponsor and partner for the MassBio State of Possible Conference every year. Uh, so we wouldn't be able to be the best place in the world for this industry if it weren't for the partnership with Morgan Stanley. And I wanted to get that out there first. So thank you very much. And Matthew, thank you for being with us today. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Bob. And Matthew, again, we're thrilled to have you with us. Um, so as always, I'm going to dive in with some questions, but we want this to be an interactive discussion. So you can either use the live chat function or the comment section below if you want to ask questions anonymously, and we'll get to as many as we can. So let's start with you, Matthew. It's been an exciting few weeks. It looks more and more like two COVID-19 vaccines will gain FDA approval as early as this month. Given the level of investment in COVID-19 vaccines, what kind of disruption around future vaccine investment do you forecast? Will investment around vaccines see a renewed resurgence in the long term? It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. And um, I think there are probably two things that, that are worth talking about. So the, the first one is there have been a lot of companies that have received significant capital from the government right across this and that's helped them whether accelerate a COVID vaccine but also build out manufacturing build out supply um, enlarge their companies and so i think that positions people very differently than it would before to invest in a pipeline beyond COVID. Um, and, and then the, the the second item which you know I, I, is also important is especially with mRNA being the, the leading vaccines here, you've proven a technology for vaccines that wasn't, you know, previously wasn't proven. And, and you know, for, for sort of the leading vaccine, which was Moderna's CMV vaccine was gonna take another two or three years before you would have had a pivotal result for that study. So you've accelerated that de-risking from a technical standpoint, obviously the biology around each target is different, but from a technical standpoint for mRNA vaccines pretty rapidly, um, and I think that allows a lot of people to, to consider other investments, right? I mean, Moderna has talked about going into flu vaccines, accelerating some other targets. So, you know, it does seem like there's going to be disruption and, and the traditional players um, where scale was very important, right? Some companies that didn't have scale because of the government investment now have built that scale very rapidly and, and can think about further investment. Yeah, and Jenny, I think, you know, COVID-19 is not and will not be the, the last pandemic. And I do hope that it's created like a renewed sense of importance in investing in vaccines for infectious disease. You know, I hope that the research that's gone into COVID-19 vaccine development will help our efforts around future vaccines for infectious disease like malaria and HIV AIDS, among others, and, and create that sense of urgency around inoculating the public against these things. And, and, you know, there's also lots of lessons to be learned about the power of collaboration to tackle the next public health crisis, whether it's infectious disease or something else. So I think there's a lot to be learned from what we've all experienced the last eight months. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, sorry Jen, Jenny, I just want, Bob, you brought up a good point, which I think is also, you know, the public is much more aware of vaccines than yeah. they used to be. And so I think public interest and, you know, public demand potentially even for vaccines for other diseases could, could go up because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And Bob, we talk about this a lot, but it kind yeah. of, it makes us think, you know, why can't we have an operation warp speed for every unmet medical need? You know, obviously we can't pour the billions and billions of dollars as we have into the pandemic, but you know, it really does. There's lessons learned, especially around what you mentioned, Bob, around collaboration. Yeah. When, um, you, talk about, when you talk about that, something else, like think about, and we've said this a bunch of times and Matthew, I'm real curious to hear what your thoughts around this, but when, when, when we talk about operation warp speed, right, wouldn't it be awesome 
If we had Operation Warp Speed for Alzheimer's or ALS or cystic fibrosis and things like that. So, I mean, these are things that we need to talk about moving forward. Yep, yep, no, definitely. I mean, the, the level of involvement and investment, right, has, has really transformed. I mean, I guess that the one thing I'd sort of counterbalance with that a little bit is we, we've been fortunate here where the biology around the spike protein isn't that complex. And so that's allowed us to move quickly and also be successful. Whereas other diseases, for example, like Alzheimer's or things yeah. like that, the biology is clearly much more complex. And so yeah. even if we had that level of investment from the government, it still might take more time because the likelihood that we, we you know, figure out things about the biology just takes longer. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of other disease areas, I mean, we have seen incredible advancements over the last several years in rare disease and cancer, um, you know, which does give patients with unmet medical needs a new hope and it draws investors from around the world. So let's talk a little bit about what therapeutic areas you forecast as having the most investment potential. Maybe let's look at next year and then what do the next three to five years look like? Um, I don't know if I can tell you specifically for next year, but, you know, as I think about the areas where I'm seeing a lot more investment, I think neurology is a key area where we're seeing a lot more investment, whether it's from early stage private companies or later stage companies um, out there. So I think that's a that's an important area. And and again, right, I guess the other comment that I would make is when you see GWAS studies or things like that, people are starting to pick up targets especially in neurology, but other unmet needs where there haven't been a lot of investment previously. And so I think that, um, you know, I think that's a pretty, pretty interesting area for significant investment. And hopefully we're going to have some successes there, which is going to lead to more capital, right? Um, so that, that's probably one area that I would highlight. And then, you know, I mean, I think that the sort of flip side to that is there's other, you know, there's other areas where I think you're just going to see a lot of continued investment. For example, cancer, right? I mean, there's still a lot of targets there. There's still a lot of work. So I think some of the areas where we've already seen a lot of investment, you're going to see more. Yeah, Jenny, I, I agree with Matthew. And I'd add to that, you know, here, especially on the East Coast and in our cluster here, I think we're going to continue, continue to see major investment in rare diseases. Um, you know, this is all going to be fueled by advancements in cell and gene therapies. And, and we talk about it a lot. Cell and gene therapy, it uh, addresses the underlying cause of disease changes the course of disease, and in some cases, cure disease. I mean, this is huge. You know, in, in the next three to five years, I expect to see more investment in therapies that combine experimental and computational data. Like we, what we talk about at MassBio is convergence, right? The convergence between digital tech and biotech, and it's all outlined in MassBio's five-year strategic report. But I think if we don't continue to focus on what's next, especially in the areas of digital health and AI, we're not going to be able to stay on top. And I think, again, going back to how this ties into COVID, and Matthew, not, not, not even as much as that huge, uh, significant investment from government, I think what I'm the most excited about is the way our industry now, the life sciences industry, is working in a collaborative fashion. You know, I've, I've been involved with this industry for 18 years since my son with cystic fibrosis was born. And I've been on board here at MassBio for the last 13 and a half years, directly, daily, intimately involved with this industry. And I've never seen this level of urgency and collaboration and, and teamwork. So I'm just hoping that that, I'm confident that that will pull through uh, after COVID-19. So when there is another pandemic, we'll be able to respond, quick, respond quicker, better, faster, be more proactive, and we can take all of these lessons learned to traditional research for all sorts of other indications. Absolutely. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, obviously COVID has wrecked havoc on the world's economies. But the stock, stock market seems to be doing better than ever at points, especially, you know, today versus yesterday. Yeah. So, you know, Matthew, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, will this last through 2021 or will we finally see a correction? And Bob, I know we have this question you know every year at the end of the year. When will we see this damn correction? So, Matthew, what are your thoughts? So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll break it down in two ways, right? I mean, I, I think... Our market strategists, of which you know I'm not one, but I can sort of recount a little bit what they're thinking. I think, I think they're they're thinking 
that you know we're, we're in a transition point, right? You're seeing this transition from stay at home to reopening. You're seeing a lot of investment, but but there's but there's still um, I, I I guess what I would say is you know maybe they describe it as a breather, but not um, you know not significant concern. And and you know as I look at biotech, right? I guess what I would say is you've sort of seen you know. On the one hand, right, people that have been involved in COVID, right, have captured a lot of imagination of a broad swath of investors. But the flip side for that is when I talk to uh, a lot of investors, the success and the interest in COVID has led a lot of generalists to say, oh, maybe I should actually think about investing in things that are normally what I wouldn't look at. So, you know, maybe they'd only look at a large cap company with 15 different products and they say, well, maybe it's reasonable that I take a look at some of this, some of this other stuff. And so I've gotten a lot of questions for what I would argue are stuff that's further down the risk spectrum, um, smaller, but there's, there's a lot of interest in the sector. And so I think that's driving significant investment because of what people have seen happen with COVID. Yeah, Jenny, you know, and I think a lot of the folks in the audience know, I, I mean, I've been saying that we're overdue for a correction for years now. Right. It's funny when you look. And again, I'm not an expert here. Matthew knows a lot more about this than I do, but I've been a spectator. Right. So as a spectator sitting in the front row watching what's happened here uh, in this, you know, this miracle in our industry. You know, the, think about it. Wall Street crashed in 08. And from 08 to 2012, we grew by close to 40 percent in the life sciences employment here in Massachusetts because we changed the model. There were no more IPOs, but we convinced big pharma companies to invest their business development dollars here through partnering. And we grew. And then when the market came back in 2012, I, I mean, 2012, it came back and you can watch the graphs go like this, right? 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. And I think from about, I don't know, 2017, 18 and 19, I, you know, I got to go sit with Bloomberg Radio and give a get, talk about what's next for the market and what's going to happen in, 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 in the life sciences. And I always say, well, it's going to slow down this year. It's going to slow down. It hasn't. It hasn't. So I, I don't even want to say that anymore, right? Because I'm not very good at this. Clearly, it keeps going, which is great news. And I think I'm just, I, I think what I need to say is that, you know, science continues, great science, breakthrough science, leading edge science, whatever you want to call it, continues to be rewarded by Wall Street, right? We've seen that. So as long as we continue to focus on what's like, look at, even in COVID alone, guys, 90 companies are in Massachusetts proper are doing research on whether, whether it's COVID-19 related diagnostics, therapeutics, or vaccines. Look at this, this Moderna story is amazing. It's right here, guys. It's right here. And, and, and look at the roots that Pfizer has here. Look at all of them that are, that are working on vaccines, have these uh, oh, many of them have roots here in Massachusetts. So I, I guess what I'm going to say that, you know, I, I think things are going to continue to go, but yeah, we are due for a correction. I've been saying that 17, 18, 19, and 2020. Look at, we have the strong, look at how strong the last two quarters were for Massachusetts based companies that had uh, IPOs. It's amazing. Let's talk about that, Bob. Let's talk about the IPOs. Can you give us kind of a rundown of what did 2019 and then 2020 look like? We thought 2019 was the best year in the history of years, right? I mean, we can show you the charts and graphs. We'll go to massbio.org and pull up our industry stats number and look at the charts and graphs that are there. We don't have time to go through them right now, but it was amazing how amazing 2019 was. Then 2020 happens. We're off gangbusters. Five IPOs in, in 2020. And then March comes and we're like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I, our membership at MassBio is 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 amazingly strong right now. When you look at the IPO mark, so Q1, Q2 were, were good for IPOs, but when you look at last quarter, it was amazing. What was the number? It was like 22 companies, I think, had IPOs. It's a, a insane. We had number. double in Massachusetts, at least. I think we had double the number of biotech IPOs in 2020 than 2019, which. How can they would have thought that during a pandemic, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so when you think about um, how are we going to come through this, I don't know. It's it's due to slow down, but I've said that every year. So, don't don't make many bets on what I say. <laughs> 
Yeah, Matthew, what do you predict for the IPO market in 2021? I mean, will we see so many companies continue to go public with such high valuations or will there be a shift? Um, I, I, I guess I put myself in Bob's camp. I, I'm not very good at predicting that one either. Um, I, I guess I'd make, I'd make two comments. The first one is, and it's probably pretty obvious, but um, the interest you know, given just the comments that you guys made about the number of IPOs this year, the interest in biotech, the interest in, um, you know, healthcare as a solution, you know, has really gone up significantly. And so the broad investor appeal has led to a lot of interest in these companies. And, and, and you know, even after so many years of, you know, three or four or five years, right, of a very strong IPO market, the, the private companies I continue to meet with, there's lots of new emerging ideas. And I think it just speaks to the, the jump in technology. And, you know, as Bob was talking about earlier, the, the marrying of tech into, you know, traditional drug development. And, and that's encouraging, you know, a broader group of investors to look at these companies. And so, you know, there are a lot of factors which um, support uh, many new companies getting a lot of investor interest. So, you know, I think we'll have to see, but, um, you know, right now all of the feedback I get continues to be pretty pro promising and positive. Yeah, I love that. And Bob, we talk about that a lot, right? There's sort of this renewed sense of understanding and appreciation for everything our industry does and just how hard it is to, you know, bring a new drug to market. I think Matthew, to your earlier point, I mean, this was almost a simpler vaccine to figure out, but you know, then we look at Alzheimer's and all these other disease areas that really isn't. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope, I mean, Bob, what are your thoughts? Is that going to change kind of the perception of our industry long-term? I mean, we know in Massachusetts, they're already talking about kind of ill-advised drug pricing legislation again. So, I mean, how do we make this stick? Yeah, I mean, I have the, the pleasure and the honor to be the conduit between our industry and government officials and politicians and elected officials. And, you know, I am a recovering politician, but I'm in complete recovery now. I've been out long enough. But when you look at, like, I never would have thought that the entire world's economy would be relying on a vaccine, right? So it's horrible. It's horrible for the world. This pandemic is horrible, but it also is an opportunity for our industry to highlight what it is that we do to think that everybody's walking on the earth experiencing an unmet medical need now they know what it feels like to have cancer or have cystic fibrosis because they're waiting for a vaccine so they can get back to normal so this is an opportunity in time and i've had government officials very high ranking government officials say geez well why does it take so long to and why is it so hard to invent a vaccine and i'm like are you kidding me We've been talking about this for years. Why did, why did it take 18 years and $13 billion to invent a drug that's keeping my kid with cystic fibrosis alive? If it was easy, don't you think we would have done it quicker? Right? This stuff isn't easy. So, you know, it's really important that we continue to educate government officials that, you know, this is what we do. Value. There is value to this. Think of what this vaccine is going to do to bring back our economy and keep people working and keep people in school, keep people in restaurants, keep people alive. Right. This is what we do. So let's let's drive that message home so that when this is behind us, people don't just forget. And we can continue to do the amazing work that we do to solve unmet medical needs. It's so, so, so important. Absolutely. And I think, too, it's important to remind, you know, people that not all drugs and vaccines are this, this successful, right? Nine out of 10 drugs fail. So again, I, I think we there's kind of a double edged sword of this, we need to have people appreciate the industry, but also understand that drug discovery is very complicated. So let's talk a little bit about kind of those, those COVID vaccines that maybe don't make it don't get approved or get approved later. I mean, what happens to that? Do we see wasted investment or Matthew, to your point, we kind of use those learnings to translate to other areas? Yeah, you know, I take a crack at that and just say that none of this is wasted. Research is never wasted. The research that is done leads to further research. OK, that's how it works. And, and when you think about this in COVID-19, we need to distribute a vaccine to every single person in the world, which will take 
efforts of so many vaccine developers, not just the first, not just the second, not just the third. I, I mean, over the next years, plus think of what's going to be required. So, you know, we're, we're also going to come to find that some vaccines will work better for certain populations. And therefore, we're going to need to mix and match and really match the right vaccine with the right patient. And the only way to do that is to have more options. You know, and even if some of the later vaccines are not ultimately approved or approved la later, like I said, those scientific learnings, they will be and can be translated to other disease areas. And, you know, as I kind of stated earlier, regardless, drug development, it's a risky business. Nine out of 10 drugs fail. Our industry and the investors understand that. And, you know, it's not such a different risk for other diseases out there. So this, this will never, ever go to waste. We, we, and, and, and as I stated earlier, as an industry, as a scientific community, as a drug discovery community, we are getting so much better. And, and sometimes it takes, you know, uh, like look at the economic downturn from 08 to 2012, caused us to create external innovation and do things better. This pandemic has created us, it's caused us to have to do things better and more efficiently. And we're gonna take that with us on the other side of this pandemic and we'll come through it stronger. And I, I, I'd highlight two things, right? And I think Bob highlighted this, but you know, the emerging markets, right? There's a lot of people who live in countries that are gonna need vaccines um, and just given supply constraints, right, the, the first two aren't going to be able to meet all of that need, especially around the world. So there, there's going to be an important need there. And then, and then the second thing that we've, we don't really have evidence for yet is we, we don't know how often you're going to need to get these. There might be a market for boosters. You might need to mm. see, um, you know, be boosted at a, at a certain period of time. And again, um, certain vaccine makers may choose different markets depending on the pricing, et cetera. So you're going to need different kinds of vaccines, I think, to meet that global demand. Yeah, I, I think I couldn't agree with you more, Matthew. I think that these, hey, there's going to be things with these first uh, vaccines that are less than ideal, right? Keeping the temperature control, the two, two, two shots instead of one. Hey, we know in this industry, people always try to come up with that next generation of therapy that's better, more convenient, easier to distribute, easier to store. I just think you're going to see a lot of that happening as well. But hey, I, I don't know. We, we talked about it a little bit earlier. When I heard Dr. Fauci say last night that by April, there's a good chance that anyone who wants this vaccine will be able to get it. Come on, guys. We just got to get through this winter, keep moving along, and, and we're going to have this thing done. And hopefully by next summer, we'll have more control in place where we can get back to business the way we used to. And, it, and you know something, it won't, wouldn't have happened without the amazing uh, people, smart people that go to work each and every day in the life sciences industry around the globe to make this happen. So I don't know, I'm having a real optimistic type day, guys. This is, this is a good day. Awesome. I love it. So we only have about five minutes left. So let's kind of end on that optimistic note. I mean, what are both of your kind of high level predictions for 2021? I mean, is it bright? Is the future over the next year bright? Matthew, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always excited to see more pipeline developments. I think there's a lot of, like I was talking about, I think there's a lot of potential success we could see in neurology. And so that's an area I'm, I'm very focused on. And, 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 and I agree with Bob, right? I mean, you know, we've been saying since April, by the middle of 2021, most people in, in the U.S. will be vaccinated. And I think, you know, it's just clearer and clearer that that's going to happen. And so, you know, back, hopefully back to normal as that even, you know, looks a little bit different. But um, I, I think we're, we're, we're clearly headed in the right direction. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I alluded to my opinion uh, a, a few moments ago, but I think the future is brighter than you could ever imagine. Right. I think we've gone from the golden age of science into the platinum age. Right. When you think of, you know, where we've gone from precision medicine to cell and gene therapy to cures. And now, hey, a little hiccup along the way, a pandemic. Bring it. Right. Look at we created. It would take four to 20 years to invent vaccines in the past. And now we're doing it in less than a year. That's amazing, folks. It's amazing. So let's get through this pandemic. We didn't know what 2020 was going to look like. And again. Don't take me wrong. This is the loss of life, the loss of employment, the loss of so much because of this pandemic is catastrophic. And I'm not trying to uh, minimize that, but 
look, we're getting through this. We're going to get through this. And before you know it, we're going to be on the other side of it. And I honestly, when you look at all the different indicators here in Massachusetts, the metrics that we use to measure success moving forward, new company creation, venture capital investment, IPO investment. When you look at the amount of companies that are looking to relocate and grow here, our economic development team can't keep up with what's going on right now. We realized through this, this pandemic that supply chain was broken, global supply chain broke it, right? We, we, we've turned into a just-in-time inventory world when we need a bit of just-in-case inventory. So where are those people going to build a, you know, manufacturing facilities for API and contract manufacturers for all these amazing things we're talking about. You saw the news about a co company like Resilience that's going to be building East Coast, West Coast to build manufacturing capability for our industry. We're going to stop making more stuff here in the U.S. and we got a great workforce to do that here in Massachusetts. So I just think that the next, I think the next five years are going to be more gangbusters crazy good than the last five years. I, I do. And, and, and again, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's horrible. It's a disaster, but we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it and it's going to be better afterwards. Love that optimistic tone from both of you. Um, and we're going to we're going to explore that issue of biomanufacturing as well. We have an event on the 8th with Mass Econ, Mass Bioed and Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. For everyone who wants to hear more about what Bob was talking about, please join us then. Um, but I just wanted to thank Matthew for his insights today and Morgan Stanley for being such a great partner to MassBio and the industry here. And Bob, thank you as always for your enthusiasm and positivity. Yeah, I wanna thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you to Joe Malarney and the team at Morgan Stanley for always being there to help our companies succeed because when our companies succeed, patients succeed and we keep people alive and healthy and there's nothing better than that. We couldn't do it without Morgan Stanley. Nice, awesome. nice to be here with both of you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. And audience, we have our final town hall of the year. It's December 15th. We're going to have MassBio COO Kendall Berlin O'Connell, who many of you know, join Bob to recap MassBio's initiatives over 2020 and also provide a preview of what we have to come for members in 2021. So we hope to see you all there. And thank you again for your time and insights, Matthew and Bob. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you.